much for being here tonight. We are beginning a new quarter. I know and I'm sure many of you had a, a, a fantastic day and probably also a long day as well. So thank you for your attendance. It is always good to be here. When you look at the early Christians, you know, one of the things they really worked on was their habits. And there is something about making this a, a habit, that's something good for us to gather together. Thank you, brother. Uh, in the middle of the week to um, spend some time studying. And there's someone who is certainly not happy with you being here tonight, and that is the devil, as we uh, begin talking about spiritual warfare. So it's great for us to be here to encourage one another, to be hearers and also doers of the Word of God. So thank you so much. We are beginning a new quarter, and this, uh, on Wednesdays, Lord willing, we are studying spiritual warfare, pulling the curtain back. So this is the workbook. It is in the foyer. If you have not gotten a copy of it, uh, you have a few extra minutes to go ahead and get a copy of this book. And we're going to dive into this uh, tonight. I'm really excited about this. This is going to be a great study and very important study as well as we talk about uh, the spiritual battle that we are in. So if you want to turn over to page number three here, and as you turn over there, you know, I was telling Stephen, you know, it kind of feels like I'm at a gospel meeting, right? You get to sing a, a few songs and then the prayer before we get started. Typically, that's what we do at a gospel meeting. I think it's been about 18 or 19 months since we have sang, uh, sang songs here. I can't even pronounce it right, right? It's been such a long time, 18 or 19 months since uh, singing songs on Wednesday night. So uh, this is going to be good, and we'll stop, Lord willing, at 8 o'clock. So if you have your workbook, look over on page number 3, and then we'll begin with a, with a prayer here. On page number 3, uh, table of contents, what we have here. And this is a breakdown. So originally this workbook uh, was designed more so for like a twice a week kind of uh, uh, going through it. And we only have 13 classes. We have our gospel meeting coming up next month. Be mindful of that as well, which will be a Sunday through Wednesday. So we're going to combine some of these lessons. And so today we're going to look at the introduction and the first three lessons. So the way this is going to work, we won't look at it question by question. Obviously, we are going to touch on the questions, but you will have some responsibility on your end where you will need to, if you so like, and I hope you do, to spend some time in the workbook before you arrive. And if you have questions, please let me know. And then that way we can talk a little bit more. And so we will go through many of the questions, but we're not going to have time to go through maybe every single question or maybe as in depth, uh, you know, as you want to do. So uh, we'll do our best and let's start with the prayer. You know, and it feels weird, too. We already had a prayer, so let's just dive into the lesson, all right? It'll take me a couple of Wednesdays to get used to it, all right? So just be patient with me. So let's look at the introduction here on page number five. Um, the introduction here, if you have your Bible, and I do have some slides here uh, with verses on them, you know, we are in a spiritual battle, and that really is what the introduction is about. And if you have your Bible, 1 Peter chapter 5, verses uh, 8 and 9, the Apostle Peter talking to the saints, he said, be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion. Class is already done. We'll get there eventually, all right? Seeking someone to devour. But resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. So at the beginning of the introduction, I just talked about how someone is praying for us. And it's not P-R-A-Y, but P-R-E-Y. And it's the idea that we do have an enemy. We have an enemy who is out to defeat us. And yet, it is possible for us to resist him. It is possible for us to be victorious, and that is only because of our Savior and King, Jesus Christ. In Luke chapter 4, this is a parallel text to Matthew chapter 4. If you remember in Matthew chapter 4, and this is actually part of your workbook, in Matthew chapter 4, let's turn over to Luke chapter 4. Uh, I don't have it on the slide here. In Luke chapter 4, this is when Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days and for 40 nights, and he was tempted by the devil. Luke chapter 4, verse number 1, the Bible says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days, and when they had ended, he became hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. 
Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone. These attacks would continue from the devil. Jesus would respond with three words. What would those words be? It is written. So that's a great way for us as we think about this battle that we face. That's how we need to respond as well. In order for us to respond in that manner, then we also have to know what is written. The word of God should be dwelling in our hearts. And in order for it to dwell in our hearts, we have to be reading the word of God, meditating upon the word of God. And I would even say memorizing the word of God as well to truly hide it in our hearts. Now, at the end of all of this, if you look at Luke chapter 4 and verse number 13, look at verse 13. When the devil had finished every temptation. So Jesus did not go down the path. He resisted the devil. And he gives us an example that we too can resist the devil. When the devil had finished every temptation, he left him until an opportune time. So think about that. The devil is not all powerful. We'll talk about that a little bit more tonight. The devil can be resisted. But what do we see with the tactics and schemes of the devil? Well, he was going to return at a more opportune time. So consider that in your walk as well with how the devil often works, right? So the devil is constantly on the prowl, seeking whom he may devour. And so we're going to talk about in this quarter some of the tactics that the devil will use to attempt to defeat the people of God, which is why it's important for us to make sure that we're truly listening to the words of the Holy Spirit, right? Where... We need to understand and take this seriously. This isn't uh, a game. This isn't something that we try to flirt with, uh, try to get close to the line. This is, we're in a battle. And we can look at Christians and we can look at people that we know that we're close to that, you know, have, you know, have, have gone the wrong path, um, have fallen away, um, have put themselves in positions uh, that are not according to God's will. So the purpose of this study is to learn more about our enemy there are going to be a lot of questions I'm sure that you have. That's normal when you start talking about spiritual warfare and angels and demons. But our job ultimately is not to, to speculate, but to stick with what's been recorded. And so Deuteronomy 29, 29 is an important verse. The secret things belong to the Lord, our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our sons forever, that we may observe all the words of this law. So the idea of pulling the curtain back really came from the book of Job. And hopefully we all know something about the book of Job. If we don't, then we got some major problems because we just spent 13 weeks looking at the book of Job. Job, though, is a great example of this spiritual warfare. What did Job know when he was in the middle of his suffering? He didn't know a lot, right? He didn't know about the conversation that God had with Satan in Job chapter 1 and also in Job chapter 2. Job had a lot of questions, and so I think it's a great way to really consider the battle that we are in as well, that we don't always know what may be working behind the scenes or what may be taking place behind the scenes uh, in the spiritual realm. And I think Numbers chapter 22, if you want to turn over there, I mentioned Numbers chapter 22 in the introduction, I think it's one of the most fascinating stories. I'm pretty sure I have done a sermon from Numbers chapter 22. If I haven't, then I certainly need to. So we find the Israelites in Numbers chapter 22, and we see Balaam, a man by the name of Balaam and Barak in Numbers chapter 22. And we're certainly not going to read all this. But it says in verse 1, Then the sons of Israel journeyed and camped in the plains of Moab beyond the Jordan opposite Jericho. Now, Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. So Moab was in great fear because of the people, for they were numerous, and Moab was in dread of the sons of Israel. Uh, Moab said to the elders of, of Midian, Now this horde will lick up, lick up all that is around us as the ox licks up the grass of the field. And Balak was, was king of Moab at that time. So what you find in Numbers chapter 22 and throughout this book and throughout at least the next few chapters, is that Balak is going to call for Balaam. And Balaam is mentioned in the New Testament in passages like uh, 2 Peter chapter 2, I believe, and also in Jude. And he's going to try to persuade Balaam to, you know, ultimately curse God's people. How can I defeat 
the Israelites. He's seen what they have done. I think he sees that God is with them. So how am I going to be able to defeat them? Look at verse 6. Now, therefore, please come, curse this people for me, since they are too mighty for me. So this dialogue, this back and forth takes place. Now, eventually, 24,000 Israelites, men, are going to be destroyed in one day. Do you know how? All right, look at Numbers chapter 25. In Numbers chapter 25, <clears throat> excuse me, in Numbers chapter 25, in verse number 1, we find Israel. They began to play the harlot with the daughters of Moab, for they invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So they joined themselves to, to Baal of Peor, and the Lord was angry against Israel. Verse 6, Then behold, one of the sons of Israel came and brought to his relatives a Midianite woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of the sons of Israel, while they were weeping at the doorway of the tent of meeting. When Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he arose from the midst of the congregation and took a spear in his hand, and he went after the man of Israel into the tent and pierced both of them through the man of Israel and the woman through the body. So the plague on the sons of Israel was checked. Those who died by the plague were 24,000. Now, look at Numbers chapter 31. In Numbers chapter 31, God is going to tell the Israelites to take full vengeance upon the Midianites, all right? In Numbers chapter 31, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, verse 1, take full vengeance for the sons of Israel on the Midianites. Afterward, you will be gathered to your people. Now, look at verse number 15. In verse number 15 and verse number 16, Moses said to them, Have you spared all the women? Behold, these caused the sons of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to trespass against the Lord in the matter of Peor, so the plague was among the congregation of the Lord. And what's the point of this? Well, the point of this is that, if you remember, Balak and Balaam were having these conversations behind the scenes. Balak was looking, how can I curse or how can I defeat the Israelites? And Balaam is going to give him the counsel that he needed. Here's how you can defeat them, through sexual immorality. That's how you can defeat them. That's how you can get rid of 24,000 men in a day. And the point I wanted to show you with this is that it is like pulling this curtain back. I don't know if they ever knew about the, this council, this conversation, the Israelites uh, that, that Balaam and Balak had. And so I think it's a great example of things sometimes that are working behind the scenes, whether it's people, the devil, uh, obviously, and pulling the curtain back on, on really what has taken place. Who is our enemy? What is he about? What will does he have for us? We often think about God's will. What's God's will for me? Well, we can know the will of God. You read of passages like Ephesians chapter 5. But what does the devil want from me or for me, right? What is his will? What is he after? So we're going to be talking about this today as we look at um, this, this lesson on spiritual warfare, all right? So as we go through this lesson here, again, you know, we have to stay between Genesis and Revelation. When it comes to answering questions, what God has revealed to us about our enemy and the battle that we're in. All right. So the the classes, we're going to have 45 minutes typically each class and we'll wrap up by eight o'clock. So let's dive into this and let's begin with lesson number one. Lesson number one is called words in the word. There we go. Now, you may have to click it for me, guys. There we go. Yeah. All right. So let's read the introduction. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God, according to 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16. We know that the Bible is God's word. I hope we do. And God has communicated his will for us through words. Therefore, it's important we understand the meaning of words found in the scriptures. So sometimes words are taken out of context. Sometimes words are used that... Uh, are just are not what they are meant to, to be understood as when we think, out, think about words from 
the scripture. And so I asked you guys some questions, or really one main question. Uh, what are some words, that, Bible words, that you have heard others use in a way that is, you know, not correct or inaccurate? What are some words that come to mind? There's probably one big one, right? But what's a word that comes to mind? What, what thought do you have? Pastor. That's right. That's right. Many people think Benjamin Lee is the pastor of the West Main Church. I am not the pastor of the West Main Church. We actually have four pastors here at West Main. Pastors, elders, shepherds. It's all talking about the same particular office. All right. So that's the word. Yeah. Baptism is exactly what I was thinking. It's one of the big words. If you're having a Bible study with someone, First, you want to ask them when you talk about baptism, what do you mean by that? A lot of people may be talking about infant baptism. Well, infant baptism, baptism in their mind is it's a sprinkling, right? And so understanding coming to the proper terms with what words mean. Yes. Bishop. Yeah, I don't know if we really hear too much about bishop, but again, bishop is going to fall into that same category, right, with with pastor you know, I, when I think of bishop, I only really hear one guy that's usually Bishop T.D. Jakes, right? You hear him. Uh, but, but yeah, bishop is, is a term that sometimes may be a little bit confused. Yeah, Nikki, and then Elena. Miracle, yeah. The Cowboys are three and one. That's not a miracle, all right? It's not a miracle. And you know they're not going to win the playoffs. But uh, a last second field goal, 55 yarder field goal, that's not a miracle, all right? Uh, so understanding what a miracle is becomes really important. In fact, making sure that we appreciate the miracles that we have in the scriptures become really important as well. Elena. Oh, that's a great one too. Yeah. Uh, faith. Yes. Yeah. So sometimes people use and describe faith, this idea of blind faith. Uh, well, I, you know, I just, I don't think, I don't know, you know, just kind of blind faith just in case. Yeah, that's a great point. So understanding the kind of faith that we need to have. So yeah, baptism, faith, miracle, pastor, bishop. What else? Yeah, that's a great one too. Yeah, love is another great one as well where Jesus said, if you love me, you'll do what? keep my commandments. So sometimes the view, the way that, the way that we think about love is not the way that, that God really uh, is, is talking about it. What else? One more. Christian. Yeah, Christian. That's a big term. And understanding all that encompasses that and uh, making sure we're not Christian-ish, right, with, uh, with how we understand that term. Yeah, that's a very important one as well. So this is important because as we think about the devil, and how he's described, the devil, Satan, uh, other terms that may be used to refer to him. So this first lesson was really just kind of exploring uh, certain terms. And I, I do want to begin with the term Lucifer. Again, we're not going to have 30 minutes on one question. Um, but if you want to turn over to Isaiah chapter 14, I can remember when I was in um, uh, Rockford, it feels like all the congregations that I've been a part of have a West in them, right? West Maine. What was Rockford, Nikki? West Side. <laughs> I'm all part of the West, okay? So it was, a, it was a West Side church, and I can remember the preacher talking about, I believe, Isaiah 14, and also another text in, uh, in the book of Ezekiel. So uh, I think Lucifer may be one of those terms, not maybe, it is a term that many people often refer to um, when talking about the devil. And I think this is a, a text that is often abused, and there could be some, some different views. A couple of thoughts, and I asked you guys to look at a couple of things. Number one, Isaiah chapter 13 through 23, as we talked about, I don't know when, 2019 or 2020 when I taught the book of Isaiah, is a pronouncement of judgments against nations. So if you look at Isaiah chapter 13 and verse number one, the oracle concerning Babylon, which Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw. If you look at verse 17 of Isaiah chapter 13, and the reason why I'm showing you these verses is because I want you to see, I don't believe Lucifer is a, is a term referring to the devil. I think it's talking about a man. I think it's talking about a king. In Isaiah 13 and verse 17, Isaiah also would say, uh, revealing the, the will of God, Behold, I'm going to stir up, talking to, or God here, Behold, I'm going to stir up the Medes against them. So he's talking about nations, Babylon 
and the Medes, all right? So if you turn over to Isaiah chapter 14, it's a continuation here. And in verse number three, the Bible says, and it will be in the day when the Lord gives you rest from your pain and turmoil and harsh service in which you have been enslaved, that you will take up this taunt against who? The, the king of Babylon. So within this context, when you get to verse 12, that's where we find the term Lucifer. And so when you look at the context, he's, he's talking about the king of Babylon here. How have you fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, son of the dawn? You have been cut down to the earth. You have weakened the nations. So I, I wanted to put Lucifer in here because it is a term, and it, I can't remember when it may have really began, first, second, third, maybe fourth century, this idea that Lucifer is talking about the devil. And so when you look at Isaiah 13, Isaiah 14, it appears that he's talking about a king, a man. Does that make sense? Did I see a hand? No? Okay. Any questions with that? So the point of this is words in the word are important. Please. It was but I think I can understand how people would take uh, chapter 14, verses 12 through 21, and think of Lucifer as the devil, because yes. as I'm sure we all know, uh, Satan, the devil, was indeed an angel that was cast out of heaven, and this, and the word, the wording that is used in this series of verses can be used to sort of can be interpreted in such a way that it would seem to be described being, well, Satan's fall, even though, as you said, it would be more likely with the context of the previous chapter included, would be more talking about a physical king, a man who is basically, you know, I guess, falling from grace in a more mortal state. Yeah, so you're saying a couple of things. Number one, you're saying, I think, um, you know, some of the attributes, right, uh, the king of Babylon, um, whichever king this was referring to, you know, I think about King uh, Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, you think about uh, uh, Belshazzar and Daniel chapter five as well, right? Uh, especially with the Medes coming against them. Um, so when you think about pride and arrogance and this great fall that would take place, certainly my main point here is that he is saying you take up this taunt against the king of Babylon. Right. So he's, he's talking about the king of Babylon. So while there could be some some qualities and attributes here, uh, he still is saying you take this against the king of Babylon, please. Yeah, well, and the, yeah, that's exactly right. And, and when, or, you know, everything that took place and look, I have questions about, you know, what, you know, when and how all these things happened at the beginning. So yeah, the, the, the point is, and JD, I can appreciate your thoughts there as well, where certainly the devil is, is full of pride, right? And arrogance, but keeping with, keeping it within the context, that's my understanding. When you look at this king, this nation, uh, and this king that's going to go to the earth, that's going to go to the grave. And so that was an example here. Uh, and this, uh, this uh, iPad went off. Uh, the, the, the slides went off. I can see the slides pretty good. Um, but uh, maybe you can help me out with it. So that's one example. Now let's, let's dive into the term um, or the word devil. All right. So when you look up the word devil, it's the idea of diablos, to slander, to accuse falsely. And I asked you guys to read some passages. If you didn't read them, then we can talk a little bit about them here in, the, in class. Um, as you read these passages, what stood out to you with how the devil is described? The way that he's described, the things that he's doing, give us even more insight against or toward our enemy. So for about a minute, give me some feedback of what you saw with how Satan or the devil is described in these passages. Any thoughts? Yes, please. Persistent. Yeah, which, which text did you... Uh, Matthew chapter 4. So, yeah, when he was tempting Jesus. Thank you, brother. Persistent. Temptation number one. 
get a little bit bigger, get a, even a little bit more bigger, right? Persistent. What else? Yeah. Curling accusations. Yeah. Just kind of just always curling those at Christians as the brethren. Yeah. Curling accusations against toward the brethren. Hunter, then JD. Okay, before we get to that, what about these verses here? Are you thinking about Revelation chapter 12? Is that what you're thinking about? <laughs> okay. Okay, we'll talk more about that, and we'll dive into that a little bit more. Um, he is bad. He is evil, for sure. What else? Yes. Mm -hmm. He's basically looking for openings, even if they're even if they don't exist. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, and I believe it's Second Corinthians chapter two, verse eleven, talks about where Paul talked about being aware of the schemes of the devil, and that's an interesting context because earlier he's talking about forgiving the brother who is engaged in sin and receiving him back as a brother in Christ, and so I think that's interesting as well with. The schemes in that context, Lori. In the Revelation passage, you have to look to it because he's the accuser of the brethren, and he goes so far as to accusing them before God day and night. Yeah. Relentless accusing the Christians. Yeah, uh, accusing the brethren. Yeah, on a consistent basis, day and night. What else? I'm oh, sorry. He's not going to play according to the rules as far as God's law. He doesn't stand the truth. He's a liar, a father of lies. Yeah. He's considered unreliable. You cannot trust him. Yeah. Yeah. Lie, father of lies, unreliable. Brian, what else? <laughs> Ricardo? He's what? Sinful? Yeah, he certainly uh, is engaged in sin, and um, there's no truth in him. And that, that's a powerful way to think about him. So, very good. Uh, what stood out to me in Matthew chapter 4, he's, re he's described as the tempter. He came and he, uh, he tempted Jesus, right? And let me just go back to my text here. Yeah, verse 3, and the tempter came. So consider that for a second and what his end game is for us, right? John chapter 8 is a really thought-provoking, scary passage as well. Murderer from the beginning, no truth, liar. No truth, liar. Why would there ever be a reason to listen to him? He's described as an oppressor in Acts chapter 10. I thought that was interesting language too. I think about the people with the, the physical conditions, the demons, how Jesus cast out those demons and how they were oppressed, the man and Mark chapter 5, we are legion, for we are many, and he, he's the oppressor. Uh, Revelation chapter 12, the serpent of old, a deceiver, all of these gives us insight, and obviously 1 Peter chapter 5, as we've already read, that description of being like this roaring lion certainly paints the picture for us. So why is this important? Well, it's important to understand who we are going up against. It's important for us to understand that indeed this enemy has nothing good for us. And so I also ask you to look up the term Satan. Uh, we see this term in Job chapter 1. And again, one who withstands uh, the arch enemy of, of good. Um, some context that can be used to oppose. We actually see that in Numbers chapter 22. Where the angel of the Lord opposed um, uh, Balaam. Uh, obviously that angel there was not Satan. Uh, but that term or word is used there in that sense. Um, so opponent or enemy, one who withstands, 
And uh, depending on context, it can be used um, in a different way as well, uh, referring to an angel or even as a military opponent. But thinking about how this term is used also gives us some insight of the enemy that we're against. So I want to look at question four, and then we're going to move to lesson two. Uh, were there any other passages that you could come up with or think about that we might be able to learn more about our enemy, the devil? I gave you some. Any other passages that came to mind? Uh, Brianna and then Stephen. <laughs> okay, so Matthew chapter 13 and verse 39, if you want to add that to your notes. Yeah, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. There you go. Enemy, oppressor, what else? Ephesians 6.16, uh, the, the shield of faith is to repel the fiery darts of the wicked one. Mm. Evil, or I'm sorry, uh, enemy, Ephesians 6, verse number 16. Thank you. Uh, yeah, extinguish, notice he said, all the flaming arrows of the evil one. So even thinking about the flaming arrows, it's all designed to destroy us. What else? I see a couple of hands. Yeah, Eric and then uh, Matt. Genesis 3, yeah. In the way of them, you out from yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah, very subtle, right? Surely you will not die. What else? Yeah, absolutely. Any other any other thoughts? We could go on Tim and then Kevin. The devil will flee from us if we resist him. If he is in us resisting. Yeah. He's uh really acts tough. You stand up to him, he'll flee. That's a great way to describe it, right? Describe him. Um he will act very tough and he will defeat some because they don't resist. But that what a great thought. We can resist the devil, despite him being the enemy, the oppressor, the evil one, the wicked one. We can resist him. Kevin. A couple of thoughts came to mind. Uh, Jesus told Peter the devil wished to uh, sift. Sift you like wheat. Mm. Something caught my attention in, in 2 Corinthians 4, you know, where Paul talks about how he renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, how he didn't walk in craftiness, and how he brought this. Yes. The God of this world. Yes. Yeah. So a couple of thoughts. Second Corinthians chapter, I think you said two and also chapter four, that language being the God of this world. Then the other passage, if you want to write this down, then we'll have to move on to the next lesson. Luke chapter 22, Luke chapter 22, verse 31 and 32. Luke 22, verse 31 and 32. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And you, once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. He, he wants our faith to fail. And we also see something else here. We've got to move to the next lesson. We also see something here that is the devil all powerful? No, he's not. And that's very important as we consider this battle. So the take home point is understand these terms. These terms give us more insight in the one that we are fighting against. And the more we can understand them, then the better we can be as, as we consider this battle that we're in. And so the second lesson is, do you believe in the devil? Uh, I'm talking to an audience that I believe all of us would say yes to this, but there are many today, and maybe there are some in, in religious uh, communities and uh, even within uh, Christianity that would say no. So this was a Barna group back in 09. I went back and looked for some more information. But a lot of people just don't believe that the devil is real. They just think of him more maybe as a symbol. Uh, you know, Halloween is coming up. We're going to see a lot of devils, right? And, uh, you know, out there. Uh, by the way, when people dress up as the devil, do people still dress up as the devil? Uh, yeah, their sports team's called the devil, right? Not a hockey team? The devil? 
What a terrible name for a sports team. Like, how do you root for them? Baseball potentially, probably minor league. <laughs> All right. I'm way off my game with sports these days. Okay. New Jersey what? There you go. Yeah, still a sports team. Um, okay, so let's look at question number one. It is important to understand that the devil is real. It is important to understand that heaven is real. It's also important to understand that hell is real. All right? And it's also important, I will say this, that the devil is still on the prowl. He hasn't retired. Yeah, you know, he's not just kind of like laying low. He's still active. We're still in a battle. That's very important for us to understand. So what comes to mind, either for yourself for others that you heard, how do people visualize him? And the way that we go about visualizing him or thinking about him, how might that hinder how we battle against him? Anyone have any thoughts with that first question? Yes, please. My first thought is that some people do think he looks like he's probably I got a bald spot. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. That is so mean. That's right. That's right. Yeah, and that's why Ephesians chapter six is such an important passage. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. We probably are not considering our enemy as much as we should. But as Eric mentioned, he was there in the beginning. Uh, he was very subtle with Eve and um, you know whether it was Eve surely you will not die whether it was Jesus I believe he was quoting from Psalm 90 or Psalm 91 where he was quoting scripture to to Jesus he is very cunning and so the way that we look at him we don't look at him like he's a you know a little puppy or something like that or a rabbit um, I don't know if people still have rabbits for pets but you know you don't look at him like that right he everything about him is a lie and evil and wicked, please. Yes. No wonder Satan himself transformed himself into an angel of light. Yes. Now, some of the people that they're interacting with were also transforming themselves and ministers of righteousness, but they were really evil. Yes. So he's deceptive. He's putting on a show. Yeah. We're not going to be able to recognize from what he looks like. Yeah. He's deceptive. He puts on a show. He, even him, uh, even he can um, transform himself. This is 2 Corinthians 11, verse 14, if you want to write this down, verse 13 and 14. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising them as apostles of Christ. No wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. And notice what else Paul said in verse 3. He said, I, but I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve. So Paul believed in the devil, right? The serpent deceived Eve. He believed in Genesis. You can't take Genesis away. If we take Genesis away, then everything else falls. Uh, you take Genesis 1, 2, and 3 away, then everything else crumbles. Paul said the devil was there. The serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness. So he's not... He's not you know, he, he's, he's cunning and crafty. Your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. So there's a great warning there that the devil is real. Please, Kevin.
and uh, you know, there's a tempter out there, and there's a place for him. Yeah, First Peter chapter three um, talks about Jesus and and why he came, right? Um, verse number eight: the one who practices sin is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. Go ahead, brother, and then go ahead. Yeah, so it, I do think it is important as we think about sin, um, and I think I understand what you're saying, right, with respect to sin, but it's not necessarily always fun. Uh, yeah, I mean, the world will promote it as being fun and the, the lustful desires that we have, um, but there's, there's always a price to pay, and, and maybe that's one of the things, one of the deceptions of the devil, getting us to actually think, and I'm not attacking you or anything like that, but getting us, you know, getting us to actually think that, you know, this, this is a fun thing. And, and so much of this is, you know, we see it on television, we see it on media, you know, we see it in the movies, we hear about it, you know, but the more we can hate sin, and that's not too strong of a word, um, you know, when you think about Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil, so everything about it um, is awful. The challenge for us is seeing sin in that manner, that it is utterly awful and that there is consequences that are attached to it and that's where the devil is very cunning that you won't surely you won't die you'll be just like god and getting us to go down this path uh so that's that's the danger uh, joanna then we'll move forward That's a great point. Yeah, that's a great way to describe it, right? We can try to uh, maybe normalize or water down things that are scary, humor, you know, put some humor behind it to make us feel a little bit more comfortable. But we, we, we should not do that when it comes to the devil. That's a great point, great observation. And that's why these words and these examples uh, are so important. And so as you think about the devil, the devil is real. He does exist. He's not just some mere symbol of evil. Um, he's spoken of in the Old Testament. I got to move forward, brother. He's spoken of in the Old Testament and also in the New Testament. And remember Job, Job chapter one, we see him speaking. The father is speaking to Job or um, God is speaking to Satan. Uh, Matthew chapter four, we have this interaction. Uh, Jesus is warning Peter, Simon, Simon, Satan wants to sift you like wheat. Uh, he's talking about someone there. All right. And so some may deny the existence of Satan. And I think sometimes they do deny the existence of Satan because they reject uh, the concept of hell. And yet Jesus in Matthew chapter uh, 25, if I'm remembering correctly, or maybe it's Matthew chapter 24. Let me find out here. Yeah, Matthew chapter 25. In verse number 41, and I'm picking it up in the middle of the context here. Um, but he will also say to those on the left, depart from me, accursed ones, and to the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. And so the take home point here is understanding these words, understanding these terms, understanding that the devil is real. He's still like a roaring lion. Uh, he, he doesn't take a nap. And the last lesson, lesson number three, is understanding that Satan is not equal with God. I think that's very important. He is not equal, equal with God. This is not a conversation between Marvel and DC, all right, or which one of these Avengers have the same power levels. That's how I think sometimes people think about this. No, 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 no. It's not looking at that at all. And so this lesson was really designed to just kind of get us to see that there is a clear distinction uh, between God and Satan. They are not equal. And we see that very clearly when we look at Job chapter 1, where God gave permission for the devil. 
And he also gave him restrictions, remember? What did God initially restrict uh, Satan from doing to Job in Job chapter 1? What did you say? I can't hear you. Yeah, don't touch his flesh. That's right. So um, Luke chapter 22 as well with, um, you know, he has asked for permission to sift you like wheat. And so as you look at these discussion questions here, were there any questions that you have in this lesson? Okay. Uh, now, when I talked about similarities between God and Satan, again, I'm not saying that they're equal. I'm not trying to think or get you to think that we should appreciate Satan the way that we appreciate God. But they are spirit beings, right? God is spirit. We are fighting against spiritual forces, wicked forces as well. Satan, no doubt, he is powerful. Uh, we do have to understand that. Uh, he does have power. Uh, while he does have restrictions from God, but, but he is powerful, and God is powerful as well. Um, I had thought of something else. Let me ask you guys question number three. Did you think of any other similarities between God and Satan? And it's kind of a weird question, right? But any other thoughts? Yes. They both have followers. That's good. They both have followers. Your father, John chapter 8, is the devil. If you're not following God, who are we following? All right, Tim? Well, I don't think the devil is eternal. I think he is, I think he's creative. I think he's a created being. And I'll, I'll explain that in, in just a moment. I had one other thought. Um, you guys tell me what you think about this. They both can be resisted. Think about that. Tim mentioned that text, James chapter 4. Resist him and he will flee. Remember what Stephen preached in Acts chapter 7? Stephen the martyr. But you have done what with respect to the Holy Spirit? Resisted him. So one can resist the devil and one also can resist God if they, if they so choose to. They can resist by, by not submitting to his will, by not listening to his word. So I think that's another way that we could um, see some similarities. And again, not trying to put Satan on the same level as God. Now, when you look at God, and this is why I gave you some verses here, and we have a couple of minutes left. Let's just look at Colossians chapter 1. The other verses, I think, are pretty self-explanatory. When you look at Colossians chapter 1, so here's my understanding with respect to the devil. His power is limited. God's power is is he can do as he wills he has no limitation right i mean he can he can accomplish whatever he so desires in colossians chapter one and this is why i believe the devil is created and that does raise other questions well if he's created what how do we handle that he's evil we'll have to talk about that you have to come back next wednesday at seven o'clock all right he is the image colossians one and verse 15 talking about jesus he is the image of the invisible god the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So my understanding is the Father the Son, the Holy Spirit, we find them all active in the beginning in Genesis chapter 1 in the creation account. God is eternal. John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Satan, while we do see this language that from the beginning he was a liar, I don't think we can say that, that he's eternal. Because now if he is eternal, well, who is eternal? Well, God is eternal. And now that changes how we view Satan. And that changes how we view, um, I think, some other scriptures as well. So I know time has, has um, the, the bell has hit. Um, man, it would be great just to go to 815. I wonder, would anybody notice? Okay, you guys would notice because I just said it. All right, so we got to stop here. Uh, but come back next week. And if you have questions about that, I'll spend a few minutes next week uh, answering that question a little bit more. So next week... Um, We'll look at, yeah, we'll look at lesson three. You know what I just did? It's going to take me a little while to get used to this. You know what I just did? Lesson three is next week. 
My prayers answered. Everything works out well. I'm already a week ahead. Okay. All right. We're done. Next week is Satan like God. There you go. All right. Thank you very much for your attention.